glory? Where is the izzah that once upon a time the Muslim Ummah had? We are too embarrassed, we are too shy to verbalize the question. Are we not Muslims? Are we not believers in Allah? Are we not the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Then why? Why is this happening? Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Peace TV and IRA, I would like to now welcome to the stage our next speaker, Brother Yasser Qadi, speaking on this topic of the current state of the Ummah. Yasser Qadi is a lecturer and Islamic orator who has authored several books about Islam. He is a popular speaker in many circles in the United States, Canada, England, and Australia. He is one of the few people who has combined a traditional seminary training with a Western education. He was born in Houston, Texas, went to high school in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and worked for Dow Chemical for a short time. He then decided to pursue an education in Islamic studies. He left for the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. There he completed a second bachelor's degree specializing in Hadith studies, and then went on to complete an MA in theology. Presently, he is completing his PhD in Islamic studies at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Apart from his studies, he is an active instructor in the Al-Maghrib Institute and the al Khalfar Institute. He gives regular Friday lectures and uh, sermons. He appears on a number of Islamic satellite channels where he teaches theology, sira, tajweed, and many other topics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium with me, Brother Yasser Qadi, on the subject of current state of the Ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Verily, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our deeds. Indeed, whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is none who can misguide Him. And whomever He misguides, none can guide Him back to the straight path. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity that is worthy of our worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is the final messenger and the most perfect prophet and the most blessed human being that ever walked the face of this earth. As to what follows, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, hardly a day goes by except that an incident occurs somewhere in the world. We read about it in the newspaper. We see it on our television screens. We surf the internet and are aware of these incidents. Incidents that affect the Muslim Ummah at a global level. Hardly a day goes by except that there's a headline news related to the Muslim Ummah. Something we have supposedly done or something that has been done to us. And usually, 90 to 95% of the time, the news is very negative, it is very disheartening, it makes us feel depressed, it makes us wonder. And when we read these news, and when we are exposed to these incidents day in and day out, regularly, repetitively, it is but natural that a question arises within us. A question is formulated in our minds, a question a question that begs a response, but we don't have the courage to verbalize it. We are too embarrassed, we are too shy to verbalize the question because we feel that the very formulation of such a question contradicts our faith. And the question is, why? Why is this happening to the Ummah? 
Why is the Ummah in the state that it is in? Are we not Muslims? Are we not believers in Allah? Are we not the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Are we not the people of the Quran? Of course we are. Is not Allah on our side? Then why? Why is this happening? Why such negativity? Why such news that is always depressing? Where is our honor and glory? Where is the izzah that once upon a time the Muslim Ummah had? It is this question that every single pious Muslim, every single intelligent and thinking and rational human being who believes in Allah and His Messenger formulates in his mind. Why is this happening? But the question, the question is so problematic that we are embarrassed to verbalize it. It forms in the head, but it never reaches the mouth. We're too scared to ask, why is this happening? And in this fear, we have become paralyzed. Because when we don't have the courage to ask, how will we have the opportunity to answer that question? When we don't have the faith to even verbalize the question, how do we expect to attain a response? And so let me verbalize the question that every one of you has been asking for many, many years now. And let me try to give you a response in light of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For you see, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the answer to this question, in fact, the answer to every question will be found in the Quran and Sunnah. And when we look to our holy texts, and our religious scriptures, we find that our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he informed us in very explicit terms, in no uncertain terms. He told us of the future. He explained to us what would happen. And he gave us the rationale and the reason behind why that would occur. In one such hadith, and listen to this hadith, O Muslims, and ponder over it and memorize it. In one such hadith, narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A time will soon come. A time will soon come when the nations of this earth will vie and compete with one another to come and attack you. A time will soon come when other nations and groups will openly announce that they are going to come and attack you. And they will do so just like a person invites people to feast at his table. You know when you send out invitations, Davat Nama, you send it out, there's a Shadi, there's a Walima going on. You announce it, you publicize it. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a day will come when other nations will have the audacity. They will think you to be so trivial that they will invite one another no surprise, no harm, no fear. They will invite one another, come and eat of this plate. Come and partake of the remnants of the Muslim Ummah. The Prophet ﷺ told us this. At a time when the Ummah was at its peak, at a time when such a vision could not even be thought of, the Sahaba could not even conceive of this at the Medinan stage. How is it possible? And so they said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, is it because we will be very few in number? The companions could not visualize a large ummah being attacked by other nations. So the only thing that they could think is maybe there are five Muslims, ten Muslims. Is it because we will be so few that we have no weight, no status? The Prophet ﷺ said, La, no, 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 that's not the case. No, that's not the case. It's not because of a minority. It's not because of a lack of numbers. No. He said, but rather, you will be like the foam of the ocean. The foam of the ocean. What is the foam of the ocean? When you go to the beach, and here I hear Mumbai has a very beautiful beach. I have not yet been there. Inshallah, I'll go and see it. When you go to the beach and you look outside onto the beach, what do you see? You see waves upon waves coming in. There is no beach in the world except that it has waves upon waves, countless waves. 
And if you look carefully, at the top of every wave, there will be a white froth, a bubbling type of water. This is the froth that comes on the top of the wave, on the crest of the wave. The Prophet ﷺ said, you will be like that white froth. You will be like that quantity and yet of no quality. How much are these white froths when you look around you? You cannot count them. Every wave has one. But what happens? It comes and it goes. It doesn't remain. It has no effect. It has no purpose. It serves no value. Plenty in quantity, but lacking in quality. This is the verdict of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That a time will come when you will be like the foam of the ocean. Wherever you look, you see the foam. But of what use is it? Of what value is it? He explained to the Sahaba, it's not going to be because there are only 5, 10, 20 Muslims. No, there will be millions and billions of Muslims. But they will be not worth their quantity. Their quality will be lacking, not their quantity. And he further explained and he clarified. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet was speaking. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove from your enemies any fear of you. They won't be scared of you anymore. They can do with you as they see fit and please. And He will, Allah will throw into your hearts a weakness. You will be afflicted with a weakness. They said, what is this weakness, O Messenger of Allah? He replied, it is a love of this world and a hatred of death. A love of this world and a hatred of meeting Allah and jumping on to the hereafter and getting into Jannah. You will be so concerned with this dunya, you will forget the akhirah. Your goal, your vision, your whole circle of action will center around this world. What can I do for this dunya? And in the process you will forget that there is a hereafter. There is a paradise. There is a meeting with Allah. There is a judgment. There is a resurrection. All of this will be neglected. This is a beautiful hadith. One of many, and we will quote some more in the course of our talk insha'Allah. One of many that summarizes the situation we face today. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the ummah will be plenty in quantity. Yet despite that quantity, the nations of the earth will vie one another to come and attack them. Resolutions will be passed. Nations of this earth will unanimously agree we are now going to attack such and such a country. And they will announce the date even. And the ummah can do nothing. And sometimes the attack will even be launched from other Muslim nations upon yet other Muslim nations. And the ummah just sits back and does nothing. Quantity, mashaAllah, 1.2 billion. Quality. Quality of what use is that quantity? So the Prophet Wasallam outlined for us that yes indeed that time will come but he also gave us a reason why and we'll expound upon that in the course of this talk as well. In another hadith the Prophet Wasallam explained that later generations of Muslims will not be upon the ease and comfort of the earliest generations. No, not at all. In a hadith narrated in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, the Prophet wasallam said, every single Prophet has been obligated by Allah. He has obliged to inform his nation of all the good that he knows and warn them against all the evil that he knows. In other words, the Prophet is giving an introduction. I must tell you everything that Allah has told me. I have to make the message clear. I have to clarify the path the Sirat al Mustaqim, it must be absolutely bright and straight. I have to do my job and duty. And then he went on and he said, As for my Ummah, as for this Ummah, and we are a part of that Ummah, the blessed era has been made the earliest portion. The earliest portions of the Ummah are the blessed era. It is those portions that will not be fighting and bickering. They will not be divided and splintered. They will have honor and power and glory on this earth. But as for the later nations, as for the later generations that will come of this ummah, 
they shall be afflicted with trials and tribulations. The Prophet ﷺ used the word fitan. Fitan is the plural of fitna. He said, many fitnas will come upon the later generations, each one of which is greater and larger than the one before it. So much so, that when one fitna comes, the believer will say, and he sees the fitna coming, the believer will say, this fitna shall destroy me. I can't stand it. It's too much. But Allah will lift that fitna. And a second one, larger and greater and more difficult than the first will come. And so the believer will say, this is the fitna. This is the one that will destroy me, not the previous one. Each time a fitna comes, it will trivialize the one before it. Meaning that the next one will be larger than the first, and the third will be larger than the second. The hadith appears very depressing upon first sight. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us that fitnas will come successively, one after the other. And not that the next fitna will be smaller, no. The next fitna will be larger and greater. But let me ask you, why do you think the Prophet ﷺ is telling us this information? Is he telling us this information to depress us? To make us feel rejected and dejected? To make us lose optimism and Iman? So that our Iman goes down? Do you think that's why he's telling us these hadith? Of course not. There is a wisdom behind informing us of these hadith. And that wisdom is so that we are better prepared to face the fitna. We are better prepared to tackle it and overcome it. And so, in order to understand the wisdom behind these issues, allow me to clarify a few points. First and foremost, what is a fitna? What is a fitna? That the Prophet ﷺ warned us, you will have one fitna after another. Successive fitnas, one, two, three, four, five. Each one will be more difficult than the one before it. What is this thing we call a fitna? The word fitna comes from the Arabic fatana. And fatana, the actual meaning of fatana is to examine in order to purify, to test in order to purify what you are testing. This is the meaning of fatana. And that is why in Arabic, the classical name for goldsmith, the seller of gold, is fatan, meaning the one who causes fitna. The goldsmith is called Fattan, he causes a fitna. Why and what does he do? The goldsmith takes raw gold, raw ore, and he throws it into a furnace. He throws it into a burning flame. But why? What's the reason? Because he wants to purify that raw gold, that raw ore, and get out and extract the impurities, the sand, the dust, the rocks, and what will come from the furnace is 100% pure 24 karat gold. So what the goldsmith does is he causes a fitna to the gold. He throws the gold into the fire, but there's a wisdom behind throwing it into the fire. He doesn't do it to punish the gold. He doesn't do it to destroy the gold. He does it to purify the gold. He does it to purify the gold, to separate the filth from the pure. So the fitna has a wisdom, the fitna has a purpose, the fitna has a reason and goal. And when you understand this, you understand the concept of fitna in our Islamic religion. What we are currently facing is a fitna. What we're about to face is yet more fitnas. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inflicts us with fitnas for a reason. There is a wisdom behind it. There is a, there is a goal. And that goal is very clearly mentioned in the Quran. Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, Alif Lam Mim, أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون. Alif Lam Mim, did mankind assume, did you all think that you would be left alone without being tested, without being sent down fitnas? Did mankind think that all I wanted to see was they say we believe, 
and no test would come down. No. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Of a surety, of a surety, we tested the people before them. We sent down fitnas upon them. Why? فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So that Allah could see, Allah could test, Allah could check who amongst those people was telling the truth when they said we believe. And who amongst them was lying when they said we believe? Do you think Allah only wants to see you say, I believe I'm a Muslim? Or there will be some test and trial as well. This is what Allah is saying. There will be tests and trials. We will send down fitnas to separate the good from the bad. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us, لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ so that Allah can separate, liyamiz, tamiz, separation, distinction between khabith on the one hand and tayyib on the other. Khabith, filthy, najis, impure, and tayyib, holy, blessed, and pure. The purpose of the fitna is for the separation of the khabith from the tayyib. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests the ummah. This is the reason why fitnas are revealed. This is the reason why trials and tribulations afflict the ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to separate the good from the bad, the pure from the evil, the holy from the unholy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also informed us of many severe trials that will afflict us. One day he was sitting on a house of Medina, the roof of the house, and he looked around and he said, do you see what I see? They said, what do you see, O Messenger of Allah? It was a clear, bright day. Nothing can be seen. He said, I see fitan. I see trials and tribulations coming down upon you like the drops of rain. Like the drops of rain, they are coming down upon you. What does it mean that they are coming down like the drops of rain? It means that the quantity of fitness will be so much you cannot count them. When it rains, when it pours, all of you know the monsoon season over here. I have been told and warned, never come to India in that season. Don't ever come here because the rain is too much. You are well aware of it. The Prophet wasallam said, that is how fitnas will come down to this ummah. What happens when it rains in that season? The rain is so much you cannot count it. You can't count the drops of rain. It affects everybody. All of society is affected. Even if you're at home, it affects you. You cannot go where you want to go. Your movements are hampered. You have to modify your travel arrangements. Nothing protects you totally from that onslaught of rain. The Prophet Sallallahu told us, a time will come, and I see it, he is saying, where the fitan will fall upon you like these drops of rain. So he is warning us, he is telling us that is going to happen. But once again, he is warning for a reason. He is warning for a purpose. When the father sends the son out to do an errand, the father will advise the son, listen, don't take that road, it is a bit dangerous. Don't take that path, the road is still being developed. Go from another area. There's a warning given because the father loves the son. There's a warning given because there's a concern. Even more so, the Prophet Sallallahu gave us the warning because he was concerned about us, because he loved us. He wants us to make sure we're aware of the trials and tribulations we're about to face. Uh -huh.